ಸದಾಕಾರಂ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತಂ ಸದಾಚರಂ ತತ್ಪರಂ ದರ್ಶಿತಂ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇನಂ ಮಲಯಾಳದಲ್ಲೆಲ್ಲ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಐ ಮಸ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ Surya, Surya as well as Surya, for uh, arranging this talk on the Upanishads. So, for the three days starting from today, we are going to deal with the Katha Upanishad. It's also called the Katha Upanishad. But before we go into the Upanishads, a particular operation i would like to give you a general idea i'm sure many of you know although nachiketa is the central character of the katopanishad is called nachiketa because he is nachiketa he does not know but i'm sure many people know so um <coughs> Before we go into the actual Katopanishad, I would like to explain to you what this Upanishad means. But without that, it doesn't make much sense to go into the details of the Upanishad. What is an Upanishad? What does it mean, the word Upanishad? And where does it occur in the scheme of things in Vedanta? So we will have to go into that. um first we have the four vedas rigveda yajurveda samaveda and atharvana veda now when you say vedas people usually think of only the samhita portions the hymns or they think of the brahmanas which are the ceremonial parts of the vedas but actually when you say veda it means the samhita the brahmanas the aranyakas and the upanishads the whole thing together is called the veda not just the samhita portion now the upanishads now the rigveda for instance or let's say the yajurveda the first literature that you have is the samhita from samhita you go to the next step which is the brahmanas brahmanas described describe the ceremonials involved in invoking the deities then comes the aranyaka now the word word aranyaka means that which was studied in the forest aranya and slowly as you go on imperceptibly the aranya goes into the upanishad now the upanishad is the essence of the vedas if somewhere in the vedas there is a mention of tatvamasi for instance the upanishad goes into describing what it means so it is the essence of the vedas why is it called vedanta because it appears at the end of the other portions of the vedas anta so veda anta is vedanta one meaning adi shankara also says it is called vedanta because when the upanishad is understood it is the end of learning there is nothing more to be understood so i hope we go back with nothing more to understand <laughs> far cry but we can try so this is the upanishad you should also remember that in the traditional i am saying this traditionally because nowadays people don't like tradition much you know they like to go into modern which is good technology is good modern th- thinking is good that's all fine but you can't reject tradition just because it is tradition it's like throwing the baby out with the bath water 
right? So there are some valuable insights in tradition. So I'm going to look at it that way. Now, you should remember that in the Prasthanatraya, which is the curriculum for a student of Vedanta, since ancient times, the first thing that appears is Upanishad, the Brahma Sutras, and of course the Bhagavad Gita. Why Bhagavad Gita? Because the Bhagavad Gita, now, it's very difficult to understand something like the Brahma Sutra, for instance. Can you imagine trying to understand something which begins by saying, Atato Brahma Jitnyasa, here begins the understanding of the Brahman. Most people, it is, when I started also, I felt confused, honestly. Then you have the Upanishads, of course. But the Upanishads are also in a way quite subtle in their meanings. But then when you come to the Bhagavad Gita, here is a text which claims itself to be an Upanishad. Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Upanishad, Brahma Vidyayam, the knowledge of Brahman, also Yoga Shastri, how to attain that Brahman. Sri Krishna Arjuna Samvad. So the Gita is also the essence of the Upanishads. And it's far easier to study the Gita rather than directly go into the Upanishads. Vyasa himself says that the Gita is the essence of the Upanishads. We are going to deal with Katha Upanishad. I'm just telling you. Um, in fact, Vyasa compares the Upanishads to the milk that's uh, milked by Krishna and given to Arjuna as the wisdom which the wise enjoy. Sarva Upanishad all the Upanishads are the cow's imagery. Dukda, Gopala, Nandana, Krishna is the milk of them. Partho Vatsaha, Arjuna is the little calf. You know when the calf hits its head, the udder of the cow, then the cow gives milk. Sudhir Bhokta, which the wise men enjoy. Dukdham Gita Amritam Mahatya Gita is the essence of that milk which is enjoyed. So it's also an Upanishad. Okay. Having said that, we can't really place the date of the Upanishad. They are very ancient. So I'll leave it there because there are many controversies. Some place it in AD, some in BC. Let's not get into this. But it will be good to do some serious research, of course. But let's look at the Upanishad. The word Upanishad. Now, it has consists of three syllables. The first syllable is Upa. And the last syllable is Shat. And there is a knee in between which connects. So, Upa, Ni, Shat. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of Upa? Upa, you know, Upavasam. Everybody knows what Upavasam and then Upavasam. I'm not eating anything for three days. Upavasa means to go closer, to move closer. You know what Vasa is? Travel or live near. Upa means the higher, closer. This is the meaning of Upavasa. So Upa in the Upanishad means close. Different interpretations. One is go closer to the truth. The other is Upanishads were the subject matter of intimate discussions between the rishis and the students who sat close. There were no microphones or any such systems. Who sat close to each other and listen carefully to what was being said, the Shruti. Therefore, it's also been called the Rahasya, because it was almost whispered, I mean talked, because first you must remember, there, is, there was no loudspeaker to assault your ears. So, one had to sit close to each other and talk. That's one meaning. The other is that which takes you closer to the truth. Upa. 
Why closer to the truth? Because nobody can reach the truth. When you go so close to the truth, you don't remain anymore. So there is only the truth. So all you can do is go close. It's like trying to go near the Surya. You'll burn. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said, it's like the salt doll trying to measure the depth of the ocean. What happens to the salt doll? There is no salt doll, there is only the ocean. So, Upami, you can go as close as you can. When you are really there, you are not there. Finished. Now, this is, has a practical as well as a philosophical aspect and a psychological aspect. We get into that tomorrow as we do the Upanishad. Um, so this is Upa. Please don't mis mis misunderstand that if you want to study the Upanishads, you should come and sit in my lap. That's not the meaning. It means when the minds of two people, the teacher and the taught, are in the same wavelength, when they are close to each other, then many things are learned even without words. I have had this experience with my teacher. Sometimes we talked about how to make a good cup of tea. But from that talk what emerged was how to understand things with an open mind. So that is another meaning of the word Upa. To make the teacher and the thought have almost the same wavelength to get as close as possible. Not physical proximity, something to do with the mind. If I say physical proximity, I will be in trouble. So, ah, now the last word, Shad. I'm keeping the middle word D for the time being. Let's go to the last word, Shad. We have a Sanskrit with no entity. Um, shad, as many Sanskrit words have many meanings, they're not like English. So, the common meaning of Shad is sit, sit down. Now, you're all sitting down, so I'm hoping that this is an open Shad session. When one of you gets up, I know that you're not interested, or there's something else coming, there's a distraction coming. So, when you sit, it means there is attention, shut. Right. Now, the great Adi Shankara also gave another interpretation to the word shut. Now, one minute, let me finish this. Now, shut need not necessarily mean physically sitting down. The mind has to sit down. If you need to understand the Upanishad, the mind. You can sit here and your mind is, has anybody taken my car, have I parked it properly? Then you are not sitting here. Your mind is not sitting, physically you are sitting here. So, if the body and the mind can settle down, that sitting down is called Shat. When this happens, then the innate knowledge in oneself flows. That sitting down is important. We will come to that also tomorrow when we discuss the Upanishad. Actually, Patanjali calls it Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Total sitting down. Now, Shankara said Shad also means shake up. Shake up what? shake oneself up from the sleep of ignorance, one meaning. Other is, shake up our minds from the ordinary modes of thought. What are the ordinary modes of thought? The normal mode of thought is linear. Something is here, I am here, and I want to go there. This is the normal mode of thought. Something is far away, I need to move to attain it. Something is in front of me, I need to go near to have it. Or that has to come near me, one of these. 
so it's linear now what happens if the truth that the Upanishads discuss suppose speculate is here and everywhere where do I go to get it suppose what I am seeking is here huh? then how do I go there so there must be a different mode so shake up also means in modern times they call it out of the box thinking it's a modern term it means things need not be as you think they are there may be other ways of thinking there may be other ways of moving what if something is pervading everywhere here like the Ishavashi Upanishad says Ishavashya Midam Sarvam Yatkincha Jagatyam Yat so it pervades everywhere where do I go to seek it so I have to think no no this is not the mode of thought so this is a shaking up of our ordinary mode of thought the other is we think that we are living in a real world yeah true there's a microphone I am sitting here your city is real for the time being unfortunately we also think that it is permanent that is the problem it is not it's here today and gone tomorrow M is sitting here today after a few years there is no M you can't say few years also what if I have an accident gone so there is nothing permanent in this world but we like to believe that everything is permanent everything will continue so to change that mode of thinking is also shut you have to shake up and say hey wake up when the dream everything is so real when you wake up it's a dream but can you tell during the dream that it is a dream no so real so to shake up shad also means to understand that the mode of thinking that we are normally attached to has to be shaken up and broken which is why there's a beautiful chapter in the Bhagavad Gita called the 15th chapter Purushottama Yoga but there is a beautiful description of an upside down Ashwatha tree the roots are up above and the branches down below which means normally where are the roots of a tree down where are the branches up so can there be an upside down tree yes there can be an upside down thinking you can reverse your thought process for that you need to shake up your normal thought process we have this illusion that everything can be achieved by thought the Upanishad says when the thought is gone then there is the truth this is a shaking up this is shut I mean there are many other things we'll come slowly we have two more days I promise that we'll do the Katha Upanishad uh, you can't finish the entire Katha but we'll sum it up and I will use actual slokas where necessary and not use them when not necessary uh, I haven't brought the Upanishad with me I can't remember the whole of the work tomorrow I'll bring it hmm. so <clears throat> then there is this connecting word Ni which connects Upa and Shat what could that be? Ni is actually the short form the root form of the word Nicha down so Hindi Nietzsche down. This demonstrates the attitude between the teacher and the taught, which means the student who goes to understand must go with the understanding that I'm listening to somebody who is talking the Upanishad, therefore I must sit with an open mind because I don't know. Problem is everybody knows. And if you look carefully in history, all the greatest discoveries in science, in Vedanta, everything started when somebody said, I don't know. Let me look into this. Because if I know, then I don't have to understand, right? So, he means the attitude of mind where one says, well, I don't know, let me find out. Which means I'm sitting down, not physically, 
and I can sit there also and talk. That's not the problem. It's the attitude of mind where I say, okay, let me figure out. I don't know. You need a, if you need to pour something from this bottle into another vessel, will you keep the vessel up or will you keep it down? Down. Because gravity necessitates that you keep it down. You, you can't pour something up. It will come down. It has to be down. So, the attitude of a student in those days, a brahmachari who sits before the rishi, is to sit with your patra open, clear and empty. If it's not empty, you can't pour anything into it. That attitude is defined by the word ni. Now, I want to tell you a little Zen story about this. Um, there was a, a man, where it could have been a woman, who went to a Zen teacher and said, he was a professor. You know, professors know a lot. Uh, I'm not insinuating anything. Professors usually know a lot. So the professor went to this great uh, Zen master and he said, Sir, please teach me Zen. So the Zen master, you know, Zen masters are somewhat like avadutas. You never know how they act, what they do. They are quite erratic in their behavior. I have met a couple of them. Uh, so the Zen master said, have a cup of tea. So he said, I'm asking about Zen and this guy wants me to have a cup of tea. Okay, fine. You can't say anything to a Zen master. So I might be kicked out. So anyway, so the master himself prepared the tea. You know, the Japanese do everything ceremonially. So he fixed a nice tablecloth on the table, kept the cup there, brought the tea and poured. He poured and the cup became full. Even after the cup became full, he wouldn't stop pouring the tea. He kept pouring, so the tea started flowing down the tablecloth. For some time the professor kept quiet. Then he said, Sir, the cup is overflowing. So the Zen master told the professor, Your cup is overflowing, how can I give you Zen? too full of stuff to pour anything in. So to understand the Upanishad, one attitude is that, okay, I may know some things, but for the time being I suspend that. Let me understand. I don't know. This is the root meaning of the word me. That attitude. If these three things are there together, we are already into the Upanishad. Upanishad. Having said that, we are going to do the Katha Upanishad. Now every Upanishad, the Katha Upanishad comes from the Yajurveda, Rig Veda, Yajurveda, second. In Yajurveda, one portion which is called the Taittiriya, it comes from the Taittiriya portion. Now before every Upanishad, there is a Shanti chant part before you start. And for this particular Upanishad, it is a very common mantra which is used many times, but we generally don't know why we are chanting it or what it means. It's quite common before a satsang, before, it's chanted very often. But I wonder, if it, because unfortunately today, to know Sanskrit is considered a disqualification. Very few people know. So, we chant, but we don't know what we are chanting. No, great devotion, that's fine, I understand. So, the Shanti Mantra, this, the, the introductory mantra, sorry, for the Kathopanishad is Om 
we'll get into Om when we do the Upanishad. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavati Tamastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti Shanti because ultimately that's what is required, Shanti. Shanti of mind, Shanti of body, Shanti in the world. Loka, Samastha, Sukhinuva, not part of this mantra. So, what does it mean? What is this mantra? Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam. Now we are in the body of the Upanishad. We are just in the, mid, in the start, the introduction. Sahaviryam Karavavai. Do you know it? That there is one common word in all the three first slokas. Can you tell me what that word is? Saha. Not Sahava. Saha. So, Sahana Vavatu. Saha Nao Bhunaktu. Saha Viryam Karavavai. Then they just vinavati. So, Saha means, this is a beautiful expression of the attitude and the way in which an Upanishad is understood. How? Sahana Vavatu means may you and I be protected. Not me, not you, you and I. So Saha means let the student and the teacher be protected. Is as much important given to the student as to the teacher. Sahana Vavatu, may you and I be protected. I could have said I and you, but you and I is better. May you and I be protected. Protected from what? Couple of things. If this was not a safe and protected place, do you think I can sit here and talk? No. Even in protected places, sometimes I wonder if I am protected. But, but it's possible. So we ask, we seek protection, both you and I, physical protection. And what is psychological protection? Protection from the mind being distracted by external objects. That's why you put off your cell phones and so on. Protected from the vagaries of nature. All this protection is required. Without a protective atmosphere, it's not possible to start any kind of serious study because all the time you're worrying what's going to happen. So, you and I have to be protected. Not to worry, I think we are protected here. Then, Saha Nao Bhunaktu. Saha Nao Bhunaktu. May you and I be nourished. So without nourishment, you don't eat for 10 days, you cannot even think. No Upanishad says put your thinking into the cold storage, no. So, Sahana Bhunaktu, may both of us be nourished, nourished with the proper food, nourished with proper knowledge, nourished with proper emotions. I, it, you can have both. You can nourish yourself with good food, you and I. You can nourish yourself with knowledge. But in your behavior, if you are always angry, then there is no nourishment. Can I nourish myself? with good emotions. That's also there. But the important thing to remember is you and I, not you or me, but you and I. So may the student and the teacher be nourished. Sahaviryam Karavavai. May the virya, the virility in you and me increase. Because the subject that we are going to study, or we are studying now, is kind of subtle, so it requires a great deal of energy and virility to go into it. After you have done all, your everything is over and I can't move, I'm in a wheelchair, that's not the time to study the Upanishad. Well, it is good if you are not done before. But the time to study is when you are full of energy, so that you get enough energy to go into this understanding. In the ancient times, when a student went to a teacher, 
it is said he went with a fuel in his hand. Fuel in his hand doesn't mean go with a stick burning with fire. It means there is enough fuel inside which is required. If there is no petrol in the car, where will it run? So, when it is full, when the tank is full, that's when we should start. So, the prayer is, may the virility, sahaviryam garavavai, then tejas vinavadi tamastu, may the spiritual tejas in us increase as we study the Upanishad. You and I. Now the last one is very interesting. I always tell principals and professors, please write this and hang it in the corridors of the colleges and universities. Ma vidvisha vahai. Let's not fight with each other. Let our differences of opinion be peaceful. You can ask, of course, but you can descend, but not violently. Then you can't really understand anything. So here is the difference between an argument and a discussion. Discussion is a samvada. In a samvad, you and I are in, are in an equal footing. I am not starting the samvad by saying, I know everything. And you are not starting by saying, you know everything, then you cannot have a samvad. There is a clash, that is an argument. The samvad is when I say, oh, you and I, sitting together, shall we solve this problem. This is a samvad. So, for that, argument and uh, quarrels are not required. You need to clear yourself and say, okay, let's find out. So, ma vidvisha vahai, let's not get into this argumentative business. Even though Amritya Sen says we are argumentative Indians, but uh, it's good to argue, but it's better to have a discussion than an argument. So, having said this prayer, then begins the study of the Upanishad. Now, what time did we start? 6.45? So, I will go on till 7.50 and then we will stop for today. My attempt is not to have an Upanishadic dialogue for more than an hour. Beyond that, the mind cannot sit. I may talk, you may listen, but nothing. So, I'll go on till I complete this hour. Okay. Now begins the Kathopanishad. Now since I want to do the Kathopanishad sloka by sloka, I'm just going to give you in a nutshell a story of what the Upanishad is. There was a great Rishi called Pajashravasa who performed a sacrifice. When I say sacrifice, yajna. yajna. It is said that the entire world was created by Brihaspati performing a yajna. Simply means, you cannot attain anything without giving something in return. You cannot attain to the truth until you give up what is untrue. You, nobody can get something for nothing. If you want something, something has to be given. If you say, I won't give anything, but I won't, it doesn't work. So the great Vajashravasa performed a yajna. He had a son whose name was Nachiketas, small boy. As I said earlier, the meaning of the word Nachiketa, Nachiketa, I don't know. I have to find out. Anyway, that's symbolic. So, after the Yajna, you know, the people who come to perform the Yajna have to be given gifts. So, this little Nachiketa was standing there and looking at his father, giving away the gifts. In those days, the greatest gifts that people had were cows. 
to have a cow was like having a car today. Hmm? If to have many cows, it's like owning a Mercedes. Times have changed. <laughs> and it was such an important thing to have in that agrarian society to have a cow. Milk, manure, plowing, so many things. So, cows were the greatest gifts that were given to those who came for the yajna. So, there's a little boy in Ajiketan was standing there and looking and he said, What is this? My father, Rajashravasa Rishi, is giving away useless cows to those who came for the sacrifice. Lame cows, blind cows, cows that had no milk, barren cows. Is this a sacrifice? Is this the way to give away a sacrifice? He said, sacrifice is when you have something valuable and you want to give it away to somebody. Giving away what you don't need is not a sacrifice. Hmm? So, it occurred to him. The Upanishad said, Shraddha entered into him. And he said, openly told his father, Father, I am your nearest and the dearest, most valuable possession that you have. Who will you give me to? Terrible question to ask. Vajashravasa, one version is that he got angry and said, I give you away to death. I don't believe this. Vajashravasa could not have got angry and said, go to death. He said, I give you a way to death means you have asked the right question, so you are the right person who should meet the Lord of Death and understand the truth. I cannot conceive of Vajasravas are getting angry and telling him that go to death. Anyway, since Vajasravas was a great Rishi, you know, Rishis, if they utter something, it's supposed to happen. Bound. Satya truth is such a rare commodity. Nowadays in this world, every advertisement that you see is a satya. This is the best. How do you know? Because it's projected on TV. Every day if you see a soap being projected, automatically when you go to the supermarket, your hand will go there and take the soap. What is happening? Untruth is being pushed into the head. There may be other soaps also good, but no. This whole world is like that. I see you in the morning and I might smile at you thinking in my mind, God, this fellow has come again. We live in a double world, right? You say good morning, it may be a terrible morning. It's difficult to carry on with living a truthful world. Ah. So, he asked, ah, so he said, go to death for asking this question, who will you give me, who am your dearest and most valuable property, possession, who will you give me? Say, go to death. Now the story of the Kathopanishad, very interesting. So, ah, what I was trying to say is about Satya, truth. It is said that if somebody can remain without uttering a single lie, very difficult nowadays, for 12 years, and even if by mistake he says something which is not true, it may work out to be the truth. We can't experiment, I'm sure. So, when the Rishi said, go to death, immediately it became reality. And there was Nachiketas at the doors of the great Yamaraj, Lord of Death. It was very funny. Yamaraj didn't know that this boy was coming. So he had gone somewhere to get some other souls. 
So poor Nachiketas had to go and sit in Yama's waiting room for three days for Yama to come back. So he sat there for three days. Yama came back. A lot of death. He was very upset. You know, it's the rule that if someone comes to you, guest comes to your place, the guest is God, Atiti, Devo, Bhava, the guest is God, so you need to look after him. And here sits a young boy, son of a Rishi with a shining face. Yama says, I'm so sorry. He puts his hands together. I'm so sorry I was not here. I didn't ask you whether you want water. I didn't ask you if you are comfortable. I've done a great mistake. So, therefore, in compensation for that, can you imagine a small boy holding Yamaraj to ransom? He said, for having committed this mistake, I am going to give you three boons. Ask for it. Ask for the three boons and I shall give it to you. Tomorrow we'll go into it in detail. I'm just giving you a, the Katha of the Katha Upanishad. So, he said, the first bonus, when I go back, may my father, very human thing, not getting angry with me, recognize me, and accept me back. Now, that my father shouldn't get angry and accept me, we can understand. Why recognize me? Why wouldn't he recognize his son? Reason is, the Nachiketu went there and the Nachiketu goes back are different. Here, when you go back, you're coming after meeting death face to face and understanding the secrets of immortality. When this happens, not only does the mind change, the body also changes. There are changes going down to the single cell in your body. It's possible that his father may not recognize this glowing man who has come back from Yama. So he says, please, may my father recognize me and take me back, granted. Second boon, I want to live in a world where my karmas are all complete, purna, which means nothing is left for me to perform. There are no consequences in, of any kind. Can I teach me how to perform action in which there is not even an element of dissatisfaction, pain or sorrow. Is there such a world? Is there some way of doing it? Teach me that. So Yama says, okay, granted. In fact, he teaches him what is known after that. Yama names that particular yajna which he teaches him as the Najikeyata yajna. That means that by which one can perform your karmas and not be affected by it. I have to go back to the Isha Vashi Upanishad, which says, if you understand what is being said, which is Isha Vashya Midam Sarvam Merkinja Jagatyam Jagat, if you understand that the supreme reality is all pervading, and because of that, you also understand, therefore, that nothing belongs to me because everything is pervaded by the Supreme Being, the Brahman. Therefore, tena tyak tena bhunjita, let go and rejoice. You know how we rejoice when we go for a holiday? Why? Because we have let go of many things that we are doing every day. Here is a permanent holiday while you are still working. We think it's a contradiction. How can I work and still be on a holiday? Work by letting go. If that karma can be performed that way, nobody says don't perform karma. Understanding the fact 
Mahagridha Kasya Sviddhanam, who says this anyway? It doesn't belong to me. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa used to say that God has, God has a wonderful laugh generally two times. Once, when two brothers go into their fields with a tape and measure it and say, this belongs to me and this belongs to you. Who does it belong to? Second, when the doctor says to the patient, you will certainly not die. I am going to risk you. Well, it's good as a psychological suggestion. But really, can anybody say that? So, therefore, having seen this, let go and we'll get. I'll, we'll go into details tomorrow, even though we are not dealing with that Upanishad. So, and if you live this way, understanding the fact that the supreme reality is all pervading. And the best way is to understand this and do your work, but live without getting caught up in that. Let go. I'll explain. Let go tomorrow. We'll see. Something has to be there for tomorrow, right? Hmm. So, uh, if you live this way, the Upanishad says, Jiji Visheta Shatam Samaha, then you can live for a hundred years. How? Do you not run away from work? You can live for a hundred years doing your work. Hundred is a metaphor. It means any number of years. Nakarma lipyate nare. There is no black spot which sticks to you because of karma. So Yama teaches this little boy in Achikere how to perform that yajna, that work, that sacrifice, that karma by which you can live spotlessly on this earth without allowing the black marks of karma to touch you. Granted. Nachiket is happy. Then Nachiket. Some say after death there is nothing. Some say that there is something. Okay, that's one side of the story. Can you tell me, is there something by which you escape death totally? Is there something called immortality? Is there something called deathlessness? Is there something beyond all this so-called temporary coming and going? Please explain that to me. Now, up to the second boon, Emma was very happy. He granted the boon. Okay, he said. When he asked him this question, even the Lord of Death, Yama, says, Nachiketas, don't ask me this question. Can you ask me something else? This is a question which even the many of the greatest rishis have not understood. It's a tough thing. Can you ask me something else? Why are you asking me this? And he starts tempting him with various things. Yama. He says, I can give you mastery, kingship or numerous kingdoms, Tripuras. I can give you any number of elephants and uh, wealth and unasked for. He even says, I can give you dancing girls and music parties. I'll read that tomorrow. It's interesting. All this I can give you. You don't ask me for this. This is something which is difficult. Now, Nachiketra is a perfect demonstration of a true seeker who goes to find the truth. What would we do normally? Go to a guru. Very easy nowadays. There are many gurus. Go to a guru and you say, Please give me moksha. So the guru says, what moksha? I can give you a BMW. Oh, really? Here is the key. Will you take moksha or the BMW? So, so Nachiketa says, I don't want to this. You keep your dancing girls and your music song and dance. 
I don't want anything. Since you are saying that is the most difficult thing, then I want the answer for that. I don't want any of these things. What would I be if the world is so temporary? I would also come and I would also go. So what will I gain? So give me that which I am asking for. Is there some way to beat death? Is there some way to escape from this cycle? Is there some peace and happiness which can be found which is called deathlessness? Immortality. Amrita. Amrita is not what is mixed with honey and molasses given to like. Amrita means Amrita, deathless, Mrityu, no Mrityu. Mrityu Varma Amritam Gamaya. So can I, can you teach me? I don't want any of your marks and all that, leave it. I want exactly this. So for such a great seeker like Nachiketas, Emma explains the truth of what is immortality, how to attain. Is there something like that, first of all? Please, not physical immortality. To understand that there is a state where there is no death. Not physically, please. Something else. Which we are going to do tomorrow. So, this is the story of the Kathopanishad and how Yama teaches Nachiketas how to touch that which never dies. And the good news is that which never dies and which is immortal and which is an amsha of that supreme being is not only there in Nachiketas, it is in all of us. That is the good news. Nachiketas here is a symbol to understand this. It's actually there is no one who does not have this. This is why the ancient scriptures declared Purnamada Purnamidam. Purnamada, yeah, maybe. Purnamidam, how can I be complete when I am so incomplete? So in me there is a factor which is complete, which comes from there. Purnasya Purnamada. So, Yama teaches Nachiketas how to touch that Purna, which we all seek in some form or the other. And satisfied with that, Nachiketas comes back and his father welcomes him and says, you have found the truth. This is the story of the Kata. It's time, one hour. So, I am going to stop now. Tomorrow, I will bring the Upanishad with me. I, I can, but I don't want to commit mistakes. I will bring the Upanishad with me and then we will go Sloka by sloka, some parts which are important. I would especially like to discuss uh, tomorrow or maybe day after on Om, which is also mentioned in the Kathopanishad. How important it is, what it is and what does it take you, or where does it take you. So for the time being, thank you for listening quietly to what was being said and remaining awake. Thank you very much. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsa. Um, the end of the lectures after uh, uh, three days, two days, tomorrow day after, the last day, if anyone wants to have a discussion or questions, please write them in a piece of paper and give it to a volunteer who will pick it up. And then I'll take it and look at it and answer as much as I can. Because sometimes I also am na chiketa. I don't know. We'll re read the question and see if I can answer it. Last day. Because if you ask me something today or tomorrow, we might have covered it as we go on. So finish everything and then look. Okay? Now stay.